So welcome to the webinar, Amenities-Based Rural Development. As Darby mentioned, I'm Kerry Pridmore. I'm with the Ministry of uh, Jobs, Tourism and Innovation. The Ministry has been trying to develop uh, a webinar series of topics that might be of interest and relevant to local government staff, officials and other community leaders across BC. Our hope is that you'll find this webinar series to be an additional link to academia, industry and government in an, an accessible and affordable way. As Darby mentioned, the webinar will be recorded today and you'll be able to access this as an ongoing resource through the Rural BC website. And following today's website, uh, website excuse me, webinar, we will be seeking your feedback on the webinar today and also asking for your input into future topics. So I'd like to welcome and thank the two presenters that we have today. They're both online. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nicole oh. Dutois who is the BC Regional Innovation Chair in Tourism and Sustainable Rural Development at Vancouver Island University in Nanaimo. In this role, Nicole works with colleagues to support rural regions in BC and amenity-based industries like tourism, recreation, and culture. She has advised senior policymakers on rural development and is currently conducting research on three regions of Canada that have long-term success in amenity-based development. Our second presenter is Dr. Michael McLaughlin, who is the lead economist for Rural Future Associates, a provider of rural community development expertise. Michael has been a pioneer in conservation-based economic development in British Columbia since 1998. Rural Future was the first major BC study of the enabler, motivator, and socioeconomic implications of amenity-based migration and continues to assist communities to take advantage of new opportunities related to amenity-based economic development. So we thank the two presenters for joining us today. And if we just move uh, to the next slide, just to outline today's agenda, we've uh, just, just done the introductions. So I'm going to be handing it over to Nicole in one second, uh, where Nicole will be providing a presentation on amenity-based rural development. What is it? How does it work? And is it for us? And then Michael will be presenting on Cluster in the Woods, development of the amenity-based rural economy, and then we're going to save considerable time for a dialogue and discussion. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nicole. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, you're fine, Nicole. Thank All right. Well, thank you for the introduction. Good morning to the and welcome to the webinar. This, I heard a few people saying this is their first time. It's the first time for me, too. Uh, congratulations on hosting the webinar series, and uh, and I think this, based on what I can see from the people on the call, this is uh, this should be a very good discussion this morning. So I'm pleased to talk a little bit, uh, share a little bit, and join my colleague Michael McLaughlin um, on this particular topic. It's an area that I've been doing some research in for the last couple of years for the federal government, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go through. But I just wanted to start by saying that the idea of people being attracted to travel, live, and work in attractive places in rural Canada is not new. In fact, much of Canada has really been settled that way. So this, this isn't a real conceptual leap for people to understand it. Similarly, I think based on the people on the call, um, a number of you are already engaged in activities related to ABRD, as I'm going to call it for short. Just what we need is another acronym, but uh, I encourage you to think about perhaps what we're going to talk about today, I encourage you to think about ABRD in, as a more holistic approach for rural development. Um, so with that said, I'm going to sort of move on through, oh, and already I'm getting this, getting this off here. I'm trying to remember, Darby, how to move forward. Yeah, it's just uh, it's the arrow from the bottom left-hand corner of your screen there. It's the arrow pointing down. Ah, uh, yes. Sorry. So I'm I'm going to begin uh, talking a little bit about what is ABRD, uh, where it comes from, and how it differs a little bit from some of the other approaches we're using for rural development. I'm going to spend a little bit of time in the middle talking. About what are rural amenities across the Canadian landscape uh, that could be used if you're using this strategy? Um, also, the audiences for ABRD. 
and, uh, and I'll sort of finish by talking about some of the potential impacts that, uh, that need to be considered by communities and regions going through this. And with that said, I'll, I'll hand over to Michael, who's going to speak a little bit more about ABRD and its ability to create economies in rural areas with specific reference to some of the work that he's been involved in. And, and as was highlighted, we're trying to leave lots of time for discussion, so we, we want to be wrapped up by about 10.50 or 11 o'clock to leave about a half an hour there. So I'm going to begin by talking a, a little bit about um, these dominant agendas in, in rural, rural Canada. So these aren't unfamiliar to folks. Uh, many of us are talking about issues with rural repopulation of areas that need to do that to attract young families, and some areas of Canada are focusing on new immigrant populations. But others are managing the pace and growth and the nature of changes. Uh, a number are seeking to attract in investment, you know, enhancing the climate for either small business success. And, and a dominant agenda for many is addressing the aging infrastructure and services. So I'm sure those are not unfamiliar with uh, many of the people on this call. I, I just want to point out, however, that in addressing these issues, we often see different actors at the community or regional level engaged in these strategies but rarely in a way that brings them all together. And indeed, if you look at this, there are connections between them. And one of the things that ABRD tries to do is bring some of these uh, strategies or efforts together. Many have been questioning the best way to support rural development within Canada and internationally. And this is due in large part to realizations that the way we've been going about things has not necessarily been working. Where we used to subsidize sectors, we're now seeing investments in territories, regions, or places. Where rural areas were seen as places of production, where we used our resources as export goods, we're now seeing them as places where consumption of attractive amenities can occur, thereby reversing the flow of where we import people, ideas, and investment into rural regions. But this is an important paradigm shift that's happening internationally. Certainly our federal government is looking at the potential here, and I think it's a good way to sort of start thinking about perhaps some of the differences in our approach to rural development. Now, why are we looking for new approaches anyway? So one of the reasons is the lack of evidence and success that I mentioned earlier. But the other reason is that despite our tendency to talk about rural areas in a state of decline, there are others that are growing. So they're not homogenous. And when people started to explore why this growth was occurring in rural areas of North America, there was a strong correlation between those that were growing and the presence of amenities. Uh, typically, in some of these areas, they were outdoor amenities, mountain amenities, um, and these attracted, uh, attracted people, visitation, often tourism. And so there's this speculation that amenities are potentially, uh, have the capability to drive rural development growth. So what are amenities uh, and how do they drive growth? So just on this one, the key concept perhaps to remember about amenities is their attractive values. So I've got that underlined in, the, in red there. And many of these refer to the pleasurable aspects associated to natural and cultural features of rural areas. And they, serve, they have an attractive value. It motivates people uh, to visit, play, live, and prosper in rural areas. In fact, some say that the only communities to survive within the next 50 years will be those where people vote with their feet, meaning they choose to be in a location due to its attractive values. So amenity-based rural development is the use of these attractive aspects of rural areas and the corresponding values that we derive from them as really the resources for development of rural areas. There's a couple of audiences, so who's attracted to these amenities, and there's typically about three audiences here, in, in short, visitors, residents, and business investment. And there's been various terms used, lifestyle entrepreneurs, a number of, a number of other terms have emerged here, but an important point here, and Michael will speak to this more eloquently, 
but there is business investment. It comes directly, an economy can be created directly from the amenity, and largely we've seen the tourism industry do this. They valorize those amenities and create economies directly from them. But we also have an, the potential to use those amenities to indirectly, indirectly sort of create economies as well. So, for example, nowadays you can run your business uh, that's in Vancouver, but you may choose to live in a rural area um, where you can actually run your business from there. So this this sort of uh, attractive value or added value feature is, is something that many are trying to figure out, how can we attract that creative economy to our area. A important point on the right is that these amenities may be valued differently by these audiences. This is a really important point because one of the issues with use, the use of amenities is that people, if they value them differently, you have the potential for conflict. And in a number of cases that we see with amenity migration, which is a subset of ADRD, uh, we've seen a number of those conflicts emerge because of value differences. So how does tourism fit into this big picture? Often. Tourism has been uh, viewed as a, as a bit of a, as a sector as well. People invest in it the same way they've invested in other sectors. But I'm going to try and get you to see that in AVRD, it plays perhaps a broader role. It's, it's often the front door to most economic development efforts. And in the, partly the reason for this is that people visit a place first, form an impression of it, and then consider relocating or investing. This is often not fully recognized by stakeholders in rural development. The, the, the sort of motivator to incorporate tourism has often been through solely economic uh, purposes, yet if we realize that it has a broader uh, potential and a range of impact, um, then that's, that's just an important point to keep in mind here. So I'm going to move a little bit to uh, to what are these amenities, and there is a handout um, that I'm going to try and navigate to in a moment here too. But the uh, the Canadian Rural and Cooperative Secretari Secretariat has been investing more to learn about the potential role of ABRD in Canada over the last couple of years. And the first project they did for them last year was they were asking the basic question, you know, so what are the amenities in Canada that, that rural areas could use to support this? And so this typology is in your handout um, section in a moment, but I'm just going to kind of go through what the three broader categories are first. Not, not surprisingly, the first one really are natural amenities. And so these are amenities based on the natural attributes of rural areas, and they include climate, air quality, land and water, and these provide the scenic settings and materials for work and leisure pursuits of residents. And I'm going to get to how those are valued and some examples in the worksheet in a moment. The second category, and people often don't think of rural areas as cultural venues, but we know that they, uh, that the cultural uh, life in rural areas has a strong attractive value for individuals. But these amenities are based on the cultural context of rural areas, and they include heritage, recreation and sports, arts, work, and community. And these serve to enhance the quality of life in rural regions. Where cultural amenities and natural amenities are the drivers for ABRD, system amenities are the enablers. They enable and support rural areas to realize and manage impacts from in-migration, enterprise development, or tourism. So system amenities are those things that look, such as infrastructure, services, connectivity, and capacity of rural areas to actually be able to transform the attractive value of those cultural and natural amenities into uh, new economies. Before I get into these examples, I just wanted to try and navigate to this handout. So I'm not sure if people have um, taken a look at that earlier, but I'm going up to this handout section here. This is a very much a shortened version. See if I can grab that. Oh, hey Darby, I may need your help. Hi Nicole, how can I help you? 
I'm just wanting to get this this uh, handout on screen. Let's see how I'm doing here. It, yeah. can, I, can I get it on the screen, or do people just look at it on their own? The handout is something they will have to download uh, themselves. Okay, so I'll give folks a moment here to download this rural amenity typology so that you're looking at it. Um, it will take them a few moments to, to do so. Okay. Yeah. I can get folks to try and do that for a moment. Okay. So it, okay, so it'll it'll be um what you're going to be looking at is a table. It's a three page table and I thought it would just be useful for many of you to have with you after this call. Um, in a much bigger report to the federal government. This is what Canada is now using as its typology of amenities uh, for rural development. And I think it's of value to you for a number of reasons because it's important that you're probably using a, a similar idea for what amenities could be um, as federal and provincial governments uh, seek to support amenity-based rural development. This, this might be a, one of the most valuable tools for you to do that. So essentially what it is is just is taking the definitions that I just told you about, but what I wanted to draw your attention to was the, the fourth, what is it, one, two, three, the fifth column, and it's a, a column that talks about the value, amenity value. And I wanted to stress, I wanted to again link this typology to the comment that I made about how amenities are valued differently by those three audiences. So clean air, for example, clean air and air quality is valued for certain reasons. Valued for obviously health, access to the outdoors, et cetera, et cetera. If we follow down under land, that's valued by individuals for different reasons. Biodiversity, scenery, connection to nature. I won't go through all of these. But this value piece is central to you using ABRD because in many ways you have to find out how residents, visitors, and businesses value these amenities differently, the sooner you can do that and really understand that, the, the more likely people are going to find common ground in how they're going to protect and promote and valorize those amenities for development. So I won't spend a lot more time on this, but I just wanted to flag how this might be useful for you later after the call, and I can certainly take any questions on that later as well. So I just wanted to give you three quick examples before I turn over to Michael of, of some of the examples of ABRD we see in BC. And there's there's some um, varying, you know, people aren't using ABRD as a, if you look at their economic development planning, their planning documents, they're not necessarily using this yet. Um, some areas are using it more fully than others without even really knowing that. So we're really we're really sort of following what the field is doing here. One example, however, of the use of natural and community amenities to drive population settlement is the example of 108 Mile Ranch. And many of you uh, know the story probably of 108, but it's a, an example of taking a fairly isolated rural area and saying we have lakes and we have miles of trails, uh, we have uh, fishing opportunities, we have a number of, of activities that can happen on this landscape, and we're going to purposely build a community to allow it to infuse the area with new residents um, and secondary with tourism benefits to uh, drive settlement in that area. The second example I'm just going to highlight is an example of the use of a natural amenity to attract visitors. And, and here we're seeing more and more in uh, rural areas are realizing that they need to work together in regional scope versus a community level scope. And this is important for ABRD because People don't necessarily, they'll never really understand what all of the rural communities are in this country. So the more we work together to put regions on the map, is the, the more that allows us to uh, maximize amenities. So this example is the Powder Highway. You can see on the map there a number of, a number of the operators, those involved in valorizing the natural amenities in this area, the mountains. Uh, the mountains and the opportunities for skiing have been working together to put that region on the map uh, in a different way. 
And the third example is the community of Golden. If you take a, a look at some of their, they've got a new 2011 uh, community economic development plan, they're almost explicitly using ABRD to integrate all of their various, um, all the various components of their plan and their economic development approach. They're using their natural and cultural amenities to attract all of those three audiences, visitors, residents, and businesses. A couple of the really interesting uh, initiatives are their, you know, their, they have a relocation program. They're consciously trying to bring people from Golden back to Golden. Um, they have ambassador programs. They have uh, uh, home seeker support. And they have a project come back uh, to try and bring youth back into the community. So I could go on and on, but here's an example of a community that we found that is really integrating this throughout. So just a couple of closing comments before I hand over to Michael. And then based migration is a subset. There's lots of, lots of academic attention to migration, the impacts of amenity-based migration. When we bring different people and new people, people who may value our amenities differently, differently than the people already there, it can induce a range of impacts of the landscape that can be positive, which are the ones you were probably seeking, but also negative. And so many of you are aware of those environmental, economic, and social, cultural impacts. And these are the things that are causing communities and regions a lot of angst, a lot of time dealing with them. And so if you're using amenities to attract development, it requires some foresight and appropriate planning support. The problem, however, is that most rural communities are not yet equipped to deal with planning consequences of amenity-led rural development. And this explosion of impact has caught many areas unprepared. So the big stressor here, and the third thing I want you to remember about ABRD, is the need for balance. And so in terms of your actions, if you're using amenities, you're promoting them, yes, but you're also protecting them and you're valorizing them. So we often promote and we create economies from things, but we let other groups pick up the task of protecting the value of amenities over time. And so the planning supports that emerge to, in this sort of activity need to be comprehensive enough to see this uh, a little bit more in an integrated fashion. So the challenge for you is coordination and regional collaboration. You have to know what amenities exist in your region, how they're being promoted, protected, and valorized, and who is doing that. Uh, how were they valued and by which audience? Right there you can see some sources of potential conflict. Um, who's involved in various tasks? What planning supports do you have to maintain their attractive value over time? And, and then you're going to have to discuss things like whose values are a priority because in some communities that may differ. So my summary comments, um, ADRD is showing promise as an approach. I'm not advocating it. I'm saying that it probably it suits some areas more than others, and it may integrate, may serve to integrate a lot of the work that many of you are already involved in. It emphasizes attractive value to drive development, and it can produce a range of impacts. Therefore, there's this need at that end to be planning and pr promoting, protecting, and valorizing for long-term utility. So I'm just going to leave uh, perhaps with this slide just to promote that we are having a World Tourism Conference. If you're not aware of it, April 19th to 21st, and the, and the topic that we've chosen is, is amenities, regional development, and collaboration. So if you want to head it up to that beautiful 108-mile area, we are more than welcome to join us. So with that said, I'm going to pass things over to uh, my colleague, Michael McLaughlin, and uh, he's going to walk you further down this road. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Michael. We can hear you just fine. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Just waiting for my uh, slides to come up. Okay. You'll be using the, uh, the arrow right. yes. the bottom left-hand corner. There we are. Okay. Yeah, the there you go. I'd uh, like to begin by thanking the uh, team at the uh, Rural Secretariat for making it so easy to uh, participate in the webinar series. And uh, my colleague, Nicole, for inviting me to be a co-presenter. And I'd like to welcome all of you who are attending. And um, a special hello to the lone participant from Thunder Bay. Hello. Hey, I'm a Lakehead grad. Nice to have you here. 
want to, uh, much of what I will be presenting will echo uh, points that uh, Nicole has presented, overview, and I guess I'll be sort of drilling down into a little bit more. And I'll be really speaking from an economic developer's perspective. I want to begin by, uh, again, a reminder that an identity-based rural economy is not a new thing. The uh, interesting that the Romans filled southern France with what we would call second seasonal homes. They called them villas. This first century fresco from one of them shows a rather wealthy person with his fishing guide, horse fishing. So it goes back at least that far. Nicole has done such a good job uh, in presenting conceptually the, the conceptual map for ABRD that I feel I can step right in and start talking about uh, the direct economic benefits which she did um, identify. Direct economic benefits are derived from adding value to the land by creating products out of natural amenities. The reason why I call them direct economic benefits is because they are derived from the, the actual use. This is an important distinction because economic development is then focused on the amenities. It's a balance between conservation of them and development exploitation of them. Now, what I call secondary or indirect economic benefits are derived from the migrant enterprises that are attracted because of the amenities, and I call these uh, enterprising amenity migrants. The, uh, the ability to locate your business anywhere is fueling amenity migration. That, in my opinion, is the new factor ERD, something that the Romans couldn't do. Now, natural and cultural amenities are still the motivation for relocation, but the secondary economic, economic benefits from enterprise are independent. That's crucial for, from an economic development standpoint, because now economic development is not about managing entities, it's about managing commerce is emerging. And this isn't particularly new, too. it's been around a while. You know, we should have had a polling question here. What's the pig's name? Artemis, Irving, Arnold. Answer at the end of the webinar. Um, the um, term amenity migration uh, was labeled in 1987. I, I should point out, as, as Nicole has done, this is only a part of ABRD. I'm really I'm drilling down into this part because this is the part where the new types of uh, commerce are coming from, and that's what my my interest. And I, I would I would like to go through the milestones in how ABRD has been understood through my own history, the rural um, developer. My introduction came in 1999 when I saw research from the United States that showed a correlation between community and county wealth and the conservation tips. And there's the, the opposite. The two. There was a negative correlation between wealth and places that had exploited land. And it wasn't just that the resource industry by something new cooking good places. And so this is great news. Natural amenities, natural amenities have a value. They attract commerce. So we now have economic rationalization for placing conservation of landscapes into a benefit-cost analysis, all of the opportunities. Well then, as years went by, I started to see research which pointed to that had been inundated by many of my, sometimes with the consequence very amenities attracted them for being degraded, and those cultural quality of life values that people came for were also degraded. So, Around that time, we begin, begin to see some communities incorporating an understanding of the many of my planning, as Paul has pointed out. And I, I point to Canmore, Alberta. They've, they've been on for about 10 years. I think have done work with you. Uh, over the last uh, decade or so, the research has become quite a bit more sophisticated. 
researchers have identified a number of factors. These would be mainly the systems amenities that I'm referring to, which are very important. I guess the amenities are important for attracting, but a number of other factors, depending on whether they are in place, will determine um, types of volume of migration. Yeah, and, and, and some analysis of these factors, they've seen that different patterns of amenity-driven world development occur places. Rural, um, rural appeal has always existed. So a good question is, what has changed that enables people to move their place of work to the countryside? Research has shown that high amenity areas commonly have as many as much as 40% businesses owned by the people who first came, tourists drawn, or to uh, relatives. And um, it's, it's the ability to do business from anywhere that drives enterprising operation. And I see this as a kind of equalizer for rural commerce. Either jobs had to be in the towns and the cities. They don't have to be anymore. Tremendous opportunity. And um, global business models have changed. Global commerce has become highly flexible acquisition of professional services and in the ability of providers to offer services and combine service. So your market is everywhere. Firms around the world outsource things they might have done internally before. Professionals can get together, form a team, meet the needs of a which they could not reason. And there's, there's a demographic uh, driver uh, to uh, amenity migration in the past. It's largely seen as a seniors' generation, baby boomers. But my, my own work here, especially on the Sunshine Coast, shows that they're being supplemented now by the young. The rest of them is a good thing. Economy. Now, so this sort of background, they're, they're here. They're forming new rural economies. How from an economic development do we assist? And I see economic development as enhancing of the competition of sectors uh, attracting new investment. So do, we have the, do we have the economic development models? Do we need? Our, oh, well, let's, uh, yeah, sorry. Here, let's, let's go, uh, let's talk about the, the area and the object which I'm going to describe, which is our intelligence services. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor on your screen, but uh, we're talking about the, the lower Sunshine Coast, Vancouver down here in the south. There's how sound if you know it, pick it up. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Extend up to Jervis Inlet, include the town of, of the district of Seashell. This is a um, this is a strip about uh, 90 kilometers long with about 29,000 people. There are hundreds of small knowledge-based businesses scattered across this whole region, and our innovative starting point was to ask, can we stimulate development of a cluster in our knowledge base sector? Now, why would we want to do that? It's because clusters, formerly known as agglomerates, have, they, they occur because of the com competitive advantages they bring, and the competitive advantages have come from proximity in the past. They, in first place, they attract the services they need. You get a bundle of businesses that need the same services, and those services come to them, and typically those have been transportation, power, financing, sales, and marketing. In rural areas, it's probably internet bandwidth, which is the crucial service that uh, one would want to attract. The members of a cluster use each other's services. Uh, clusters create a pool of expertise unique to that industry. Nobody does it all, so they use each other's services. Even more importantly, within clusters, members are able to combine their services to take on work that they couldn't have, kind of in a way to extend their business reach and increase their competitiveness. So those are the three major economic reasons for cluster formation, which happens naturally in free enterprise economies. But there's another factor, and that's the social and professional connections. People like to hang out with people with similar backgrounds and education and interests.
Um, and the, uh, the, the advantages of typically come, typically come on the bricks and mortar side, and I've listed some of the uh, types of industries in which clusters have formed. Now, the profile of our Sunshine Coast Intelligence Services cluster is a group of knowledge-based industries. There are several hundred of these. Um, and they, they, uh, the majority of them do business online via um, an online medium. And the, importantly for the cluster development, the medium that enables them to locate in rural areas also connects them. Um, we, they, the group is composed of, uh, oh, I should mention that uh, these, these, are, these are a source of export dollars. Uh, the, the, the membership includes a wide range of highly skilled professionals. I've listed some of them there. And of great importance or of value, is that this is, we can call this a sustainable sector in the sense of it having a small footprint. Many of these people don't even drive to work, and they probably don't have a whole lot more lights on when they're doing work than when they're otherwise at home. Not to say that they're all at home, but that's the majority of them, and this is a feature of rural economies. Um, so here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to link businesses that do business online via this online medium, and they're connected through it. So what we've done is we've adapted a social media technology. Uh, that technology is about creating virtual communities, so it provides a suitable tool. However, this has to be a business tool and function like one, and it can't look like a social network because people will misunderstand what it is, and there are plenty of social media networks out there. And one big difference is that we're not looking for a half billion members. The, must be, the membership must be exclusive. If you adulterate your cluster, it ceases to be a cluster. We want members to be able to interact easily with uh, like members where the competitive advantages, which I outlined, are, uh, are there and not to have a lot of uh, irrelevant uh, business or conversations going on. And the Really, the goal of all this is to assemble an array of services which is large enough, a cluster critical mass, for members to find what they need so they can share, find the services they need, combine the services, and we can attract uh, outside customers, regional, local, and outside customers uh, as users of our, our clusters of services. So this is what we did. We created a intelligent services cluster Portal. I'll just take you through its structure quickly. Uh, we have an about the ISC. Uh, as you can, I'm sure you can, uh, you will agree from the, the uh, sort of the complexity of the understanding of why this might work. They have to be very carefully and lucidly explained to potential members why they would want to use this thing. And we, we, we know from our experience that some, some people get it instantly and some don't. So we, this is something if you're, you know, if you're working uh, building business tools for, for sectors, they really need to understand uh, how they work and they need to participate in building the tools back to that later. Uh, membership, there's registration, memberships are vetted. Um, but anyone can go anywhere in the portal except to the forums. We want to keep the conversations amongst the businesses that uh, have the, the, who are the right type to be members. So what we're trying to do is create an exclusive community that can take it, that can work together competitively while still enabling non-members to enter this domain and purchase services. We launched the portal in January, um, and we're, we've been testing it and, and talking to its members about its uh, its uh, you know its its value and its function. And we just received additional funding and have begun structural upgrades, which we know will improve it. So um, we may have, do encourage you to go and visit the portal. I'll give you, you'll see the, uh, the, uh, the URL for it at the end of the presentation. Uh, but uh, in a few weeks, it's going to be even better. And one of the nice things is, is we have members, the technological expertise, coming forward and saying, you know, this is, this is important, this is viable. Um, we're we're going to help you uh, make this better. And that's so critical. Anytime you create something for a target sector, uh, if they don't take hold of it and adopt it, then it's not going to work. So it's, we're very pleased to see the members um, wanting to assist us in making this work. So why would we do this? What are the economic benefits of this? First is the retention of dollars. The members of the cluster are now, we hope, 
using local services rather than purchasing them off coast solutions. Always that way. Likewise, our local consumers now have a ready access to these types of services. We're bringing new dollars because if our businesses are able to go out and get work that they might not have been able to before by combining their services, that increases their revenues. And uh, when we begin to market this cluster broadly as a convenient place to find professional technological services, uh, we expect their revenues to increase. And the third part of this that's right back to this whole ABRD um, uh, uh, trend and phenomena, the Sunshine Coast, along with so many other communities in British Columbia, is advertising itself, you know, come live here because of our wonderful natural amenities and our quality of life. But we're going to add to that. Bring your business here because we can get you on the competitive ground running. So we're giving a, a bit, adding a business advantage advantage to the natural amenities to give people reasons to come here. What are our results? So far we've had 87 businesses join or express interest and 30 of them were, were vetted out. Um, but we're pretty happy with that. The real difficulty we find here, and I think you'll find in rural areas in general, is that this is a diffuse uh, group of businesses. I call this cluster in the woods because if you drive the back roads of the Sunshine Coast, the beautiful screens of trees, you know there's homes back there with enterprises in it. So we've had difficulty getting the word out. Following our um, following our upgrades, we, we are going to initiate another publicity campaign. It's interesting thinking about doing this sort of thing. What helped the most was a story in the newspaper, and we got uh, 40 members in uh, three days. Um, what's very encouraging are the dozens of glowing accolades from the members. This is what's needed. It's about time. This is going to work. Uh, it's not working perfectly yet, but um, you know we're uh, uh, that's that's the way things often start, and we we're quite certain we're going to make it function very well. And the publicity campaign coming. Um, what are our economic goals? What are the measurables we, we want out of this? We want to grow the cluster to a minimum of 100 members. Now, we don't want to stop there, but we feel that's the minimum critical mass to have the array of services to make it useful to the members and to attract uh, outside purchasers of those. We want to know how many members have used each other's services rather than external services so we can measure how many dollars we've kept. We want, to, we want to measure how many members have been able to take on assignments they could not have without partners. That brings in new dollars. We want to uh, track the number of new businesses attracted by the opportunity to join this cluster. And of course, we'd be able to do that by looking at membership. And we want to track sales generated via the portal once we begin to market it as a convenient place to so, now, um, what I've been presenting here is one example of, of, of applying economic development innovation to new sectors, and it's, it's only one. So I want to talk about some of the other things that we're planning on doing, and I think an interesting discussion would be what are some of the other uh, economic development uh, applications or innovations that we could use. But what else are we doing? Um, we're going to we'll be advocating for. Uh, um, broader bandwidth. This is uh, critical, of course, for this sector. And maybe by adding a couple of hundred uh, member businesses to that, that has a help. This sort of thing, an office for business innovation, is um, it's, it's, an, it's an idea that abounds. And, and on the Sunshine Coast, there are a number of sectors who are interested in this uh, sort of thing. And uh, we believe if we can bring the fiber optic nodes, because we're not going to have last mile, to central locations that. Uh, we'll be able to uh, create a sort of a, uh, a, you know, a, a, a draw and a revenue earning draw that would be valuable to the members of this sector and other sectors. And we're going to be asking our ISC members, what else could they use? Do they need a, since many of them are home based, do they need a place to meet clients, to meet each other? Um, do they need um, sophisticated software or, or hardware that they don't normally have in their office? This is the sort of thing which increases the competitiveness of these sectors if you can provide it. Um, we need to look perhaps at, at bylaws. And our rural, uh, current rural bylaws are based on people living in the country and working in town. If homes are increasingly a place of business, then uh, we may have to change some bylaws if they are prohibiting commerce in the countryside. 
this. Well, we don't really even want to suggest this. Uh, as you probably know, um, rural areas uh, are not generally not subject to business businesses. But there's an argument that perhaps they should be because uh, those dollars are often used for economic development and, and are also the, the type that's on here. However, the other side of that is that um, once we start, uh, you know, people come out of the woods and we start slapping $100 uh, license fee on them, and we've also sort of sort of outed them, and I'm not sure if they're compliant with bylaws. So just hide them, just drive them away. So we're not likely to do that, but it's worth considering. Um, we want to measure and monitor the economics of the cluster. Because we have membership, we can find out uh, the size of the businesses, how many employees, revenues, where they do business, calculate multipliers. So we can have pretty good information on this emerging sector. What other types or what other sectors are amenable to cluster development? Well, there's a lot of talk about a green cluster network here in the Sunshine Coast, and I'm sure it's it a candidate for a cluster. Um, this uh, improved transportation links really has nothing to do with the ISC. Uh, the reason why it's there is the studies I talked about before show that proximity to a major city and an international airport, being within an hour, is one of the key factors in uh, re relocation by these groups. But well, we need to we need to look at that too. And we have a youth attraction organization run by young people and they have they have highlighted the intelligence service cluster as something that young entrepreneurs will use. So it's going to be a factor we believe in attracting any youth. And so in summary, there are new forms of commerce urging rural areas. And the Base attraction, your capital are, is the natural and lifestyle amenities that uh, abound across British Columbia. I believe that we've only begun to look at what economic development practices can be, how we can shape and uh, meet the goals of economic development, which are increasing competitive and attracting investment. We also uh, need to talk about the other side, the direct and the indirect, talk about indirect benefits, because there are considerable synergies in them, as Nicole has pointed out. Do all of this, and it adds up to what we're all looking for, and that's economic diversification. Uh, and I had another slide that just says uh, thank you, and it has the um, IS portal. It's www.postisc.net. Postisc.net. And now I'd like to uh, hand things back to Darby uh, to uh, moderate the question and answer. Hi, Michael. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Nicole, as well, for some very valuable, valuable presentation there. I'd like to draw everyone's attention um, back to the feedback button for the discussion portion of, of our webinar today. So, as I outlined at the, at the outset of our presentation today, if, if you do have a question now, and uh, we're very enthusiastic to have your questions, and I can see we've already got a couple queued up. If you could uh, please uh, hit that scroll down menu, the feedback button on the top right hand side of your screen, and uh, just uh, change the indicator from, from what is green, it just proceed to purple, which is question, and we will just address the, the questions as they queue up. To, uh, to actually ask your question, what you'll need to do is hit uh, once, I, once I call your name, um, just hit star seven, to unmute your line and you can address the address the question to the to the individual you wish to wish to speak to. So um, to begin, uh, Megan Megan McIsaac, I can see you're there first in queue. If you could please hit star seven and then ask your question. Hi. Hi Megan, we can hear you. Oh great. Um, the first speaker, was it, uh, sorry, is it her name, Nicole? Nicole? Yeah. Nicole. Yeah, um, I'm calling from Revelstoke, B.C. Um, we're very near Golden. I'm not sure if you know us at all. Um, I'm fairly new to the town myself. Um, I'm living here now. I've been here for almost two years. I'm working with the, the city of Revelstoke with the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Culture. And my background is in social change and development, but my my uh, concern for this town is it's an awesome town. It's great, 
Oh, we have a huge mountain development going on called uh, Revelstoke Mountain Resort, and it is bringing a lot of tourism based to uh, this town for skiing and a lot of uh, ski touring and snowmobiling and such and so forth. Um, one of my major concerns and what I'm wondering is to how to maintain this small town feel is a lot of concern of people in the community. It has a lot of young families, um, talented people, but housing prices are going up, um, local business taxes are going up and such and so forth. I'm not sure if it's directly related to um, the resort or not, but I was just wondering what kind of steps do small communities take so that they don't become developed in the wrong kind of ways, that they maintain that community? Great. Thank you for your question, Megan. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Yeah, thank you very much. And yes, very familiar with Revelstoke. And, uh, and your, your concerns are good ones, I think. Uh, you know, we... People are often, it goes back to my comments about the approach for tourism, if it's seen as solely an economic, you know, uh, reason uh, to sort of pursue something, you can, we can run into problems when it's not integrated. I know we have somebody here from Euclid. Is it Patricia on the call too? Um, we have, uh, there are examples out there, you know, one, I would definitely look to, um, to your neighbor Golden and what they did, because very similar concept terms of the resort coming in, um, and luckily, Golden had a planner, very good one, I still does, but at that point, I was familiar with, um, you know, engaging the residents to find out what they value, what they value about that town, because unless we, unless we have numbers, and unless we really know what people value, we often walk around making assumptions about who values what, and those can be very dangerous and as you sort of move forward, so I would say, Initially, you have to get a feel with broad community engagement, and, you know, whether you've got a, a recent plan for the community or um, that has actually done that. That would be a first start because that's where you get at those, value, those values that I was talking about. And the reason I brought up Euclid is because they've had great tr track, set, uh, track record here with planning as well, saying, okay, we know what people value. And instead of just inviting, uh, being open to all investment and inviting that, uh, your residents and if you're using a balanced approach, you need to kind of consider which of those do you want to invite in and which don't you. And it's not that you're being non-business friendly if you decide not to. It's just that you're being conscious about the long-term attractiveness uh, for these various audiences over time, if that makes any sense. So I would say Absolutely. steps to take, you know, is, is definitely finding out those values, who has what values. Um, you know, there, uh, in terms of housing, uh, tax increases, those, those are byproducts, yes, of, of un, uh, often unplanned growth and people letting the economic sort of priorities take over. Um, so the one thing about being in your region is that you do have a number of other communities around that are doing some in very innovative stuff in affordable housing that, I would reach out to as well. And I know the Columbia Trust folks could probably line you up with some of those folks as well. Okay, I hope that's great. Yeah. So Thank you're an amenity you. migrant. <laughs> yes, I am. Good girl. Thanks very much, Megan, and thanks, Nicole. Uh, Megan, if I could just ask you to change your indicator back to proceed, and I see we have George, George Penfold next. George, if you could please get star seven and uh, ask your question. Thanks, Debbie. Hi, uh, Michael and Nicole. Great presentation. Um, in in the tenor of your presentation, you both sort of talked about amenity-based um, migration and development as if it, and I'm left with the impression that it's perceived as sort of an add-on to what's already in place. In our region, and I don't think it's a lot different throughout rural BC, our pop we have about 5% population changeover every year. Um, what, and, 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 the large, and a large part of that changeover is related to the normal economy that runs here, retirement trying to attract people to the region to to uh, replace workers who are retiring and so on. 
What role does amenity play in just keeping the economy that's there rolling? And the second question um, is, uh, again, a lot, you both talked about sort of the business aspect, but in the work we've done here, about uh, 20 to 25 percent of the folks who move to this region or who, who have moved in the last five years have moved for retirement. Could you talk a little bit about the role of uh, retirement in this whole uh, picture of amenity migration and, and what some of the economic upsides and downsides of that might be? Nicole, do you want to go first on that? Just had to unmute there. Thanks, George, for that. Um, Michael, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what, how do you want to proceed? Why don't you Why don't you respond first, and I'll see if there's anything left uh, for me to add. Okay. Yeah. George talked about the um, sort of as an add-on. What role does it play in keeping the existing economy going? In the three regions that we've been looking at currently, George, across the country, which is Kings County, Nova Scotia, the Charlevoix region of Quebec, and the, Columbia, the East Kootenay, the Columbia Valley uh, area there, um, what we have found that is particularly in some of those regions that ABRD is, is yes, uh, it's folding over existing industries in many ways. It has a nice complementary, you know, sort of complementary um, it's not sort of about one sector edging out another sector. And so in the sense your question about what role does it play in keeping the economy going, it really is, is largely, you know, if you're thinking about attracting people there for that workforce, as you talked about, uh, if it's an attractive area then to, to live and to settle and people know about it, um, then that would be one of the obvious ones that I can think of. And I'm comparing this to some other rural regions of Canada where um, the pursuit of the pursuit of some industries, which have uh, resulted in a large transient population coming in, I'm thinking some of the areas, for example, in Northeast BC, um, with high uh, high concentrations of transition employees. The areas haven't necessarily focused on the attractiveness of place, sense of place, and attractiveness. And so, you know, some someone comment, some people comment about the vulnerability that they have if, if the resource uh, and if the reason for being there is only about industry and if that industry does go south, then they're left with nothing much to attract folks in many cases often have a negative image of the people that have been there in the past. So in long answer to your question, I would say that it play, the role that plays with the existing economy is that it, it often complements existing economies quite well. Um, and I'll maybe let Michael speak to the, uh, the comment about the retirement. Oh, thank you, Nicole. I, I'd, I'd like to add something to what you said about uh, the, the, the impact on the existing economy. Um, in our, uh, our study of the, in the South Okanagan Similkameen Valleys, we found no difference in the value placed on the quality of amenities between lifelong residents and amenity migrants. Their reasons for staying there included uh, the, 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 the value that they placed on the natural amenities and, and the cultural amenities. So, um, George, I don't know if this answers your question. They, they work not just to attract, but to keep. And we had people, we, we, when we asked people, what would cause you to leave, just as many lifetime residents indicated that it was, if there was a deterioration of the landscapes, they would leave. The, um, I'm not quite sure how to answer the retirement part of it. I mean, it's, it's a phenomenon. It's well, it's well tracked. Uh, we have a, a seniors population with um, the means to make decisions about where they want to live, and now we have a second generation, that's my generation, which also has the means to do that. Um, I, I think you know as an, as an economist, uh, George, that there are positive things about having a retirement community. I think that uh, the value, the economic value, and by the way, I don't just think in economic terms, but that's kind of where we're going today. The, the economic value of, of seniors' populations is higher than most people think, but obviously the balanced de demographics is, is what you want. So uh, I think in some of the comments that I made, it shows that um, young people are the ones who are uh, old. More senior people may come to retire, but the people who can take advantage of the enablers are younger people. 
Yeah, that makes sense in terms of the the welcoming communities work that we've done here. Is is there there are different priorities between age groups and between um, uh, visible minorities, for example, um, and the rest of the community. And we haven't we we need to do some more confusing those out. And and I do have some concern about. Because I asked the question around the, the general economy about distinguishing any migration from the phenomenon of, of what goes on in a region and the importance of it. The other thing is, uh, and you mentioned it, Michael, the connectivity uh, in the work that we did. We also asked why people might be thinking about leaving, uh, in, in, in parallel to the reasons they moved around to many immediately. Next three important things had to do with health services, personal safety, um, affordable housing, and communications infrastructure. And, and, and on the, why people leave, it has a lot to do with a lack of those services and the lack of employment opportunities that, that we've, we haven't tracked it well. We've certainly heard anecdotally about people who have moved because of the amenity and able to connect that either to home base business or a job, uh, but then not being able to, they found they haven't been able to get adequate employment for the partner and have had to leave again. So they, we need to we need to also, I think, look a little more carefully at, at uh, the dynamic of people leaving to get a better understanding of how we actually build a context to make amenity migration very successful. I agree with you, George. Great, thank you. This is uh, Le Leslie Lax speaking. Victoria apparently has a problem with their phone, so I'll just continue facilitation for the moment. Um, I didn't see who was first, either Terry McCartan or Jeff Garbutt, but uh, Terry, did uh, did you want to go and uh, ask your question? Hit star seven to unmute. Hello, Terry here. Hi, you thanks. Me? We can hear you. Yeah. I had two questions. Um, in one presentation, it said that how important it was to be within one hour of transportation from a major population center. And the other example was um, it's very important to have excellent access to broadband. And that's very spotty as soon as you get outside, uh, well, basically southern BC. Those are my questions. Um, okay, Nicole, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to that first, and then you can add if you, if you like. Um, let me just contextualize the importance of the having a major city within an hour and having an airport. That, that, just, uh, that will just be a, a forming factor in the type of uh, people and, to some extent, uh, the, the, the rate. Um, amenity migration is occurring you know, at, a, at a pace you know, at distances, long distances away. Uh, so I don't think we need to overemphasize that. Um, it's, it, it just turns out in, in the study, this research is, is from the northwestern United States, that um, of the systems amenities that uh, Nicole mentioned, it winds up being near the top in just about every study. The, the broadband issue, I mean, that, that's it. I mean, the, the, that's how the world, the world runs now through uh, through the through the internet, or at least a large large part of it. And um, as long as uh, rural areas are are behind and, and it's hard to keep pace, um, they will be at some disadvantages. But uh, I my experience looking around is that the, um, the disadvantage isn't is not crippling. Hi, Terry, uh, and thanks, Michael. Yes, the I mean I. Some of the areas that we've looked at, you know, and that question the federal government's asking is, is this a suitable approach for some rural areas of Canada more than others? And I don't know that we can really answer that yet. You know, the, the one hour, I, you know, it's probably easier for some areas in the one hour because, you know, the places that we've seen the highest growth across Canada over the last census period is the periphery within that sort of hour, or, you know, we call them metro adjacent zones across Canada. But, there's lots of regions that are much more remote that are experiencing that. So, for example, the East Kootenays uh, isn't within that sort of time frame, and yet they've had some of the most explosive growth in the country when it comes to people being attracted to the area. So I don't know that that's 
that's necessary, you know, system drivers enabling that is a big piece. But um, I would say it largely depends, too, on who, who you're trying to attract. You know, there's some regions of the country that they've used their isolation and remoteness, uh, for example, as a strength to say, you know, this is what we have here, and that's suitable for certain types of, uh, to attract certain types of people. Um, so I don't think that that's, that necessarily counts, counts those regions out. It maybe makes it more complex to attract the kind of people that require high speed on an everyday basis, you know, to run their business in Calgary or Vancouver. Um, but, I, but I think we need to think outside of those um, boundaries or limitations to say what what do we have and who is that attractive to? Does that help, Joe? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to, to, to add to, to that. I agree with everything that Nicole said. This is perhaps the place to distinguish between permanent amenity migration and um, a, a seasonal or, or te temporary amenity migration. Many areas that are experiencing uh, large volumes of people moving there, uh, a lot of them are, are secondary our second homes for people. The, the business, the things related to airports and proximity to towns, wireless, are much more important for the people who want to set up the enterprises. But I do want to underscore what Nicole said. Go with your strengths, because after all, it's it's that natural and cultural capital which is that's the capital for this, and the rest of them are just assets that um, will uh, uh, shape uh, the, the, the types of people and the types of enterprises that are able to move there. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Terry, if, if you have no more questions, could you change your indicator back to green? Uh, Jeff, Jeff Garbett. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of, couple of questions. We're calling from the Comox Valley. Um, we just recently adopted uh, March 29th, so uh, yesterday, I guess, or the day before yesterday, a uh, new regional growth strategy uh, for our newly incorporated region. And some of the things that we've, we've had a challenge with, and this is, and I'm trying to be obtuse, but the word rural has, it's probably one of the least understood terms, but most widely used. And, and I'd just be interesting to hear, when we talk rural, is it, is it as complex as I really think it is? That's, that's one question. Maybe the, the speakers could, could maybe address that. But the one thing that, from a question from a um, amenity-based rural development perspective, just trying to get an understanding with uh, sort of the, the challenges of correlating community planning work that's been done and the public, the overall public cost of these developments, infrastructure, all those kind of things, because of often amenity-based rural development, if we're talking about unsettled areas that that come with a, the, the range of commercial tourism and residential development, they they are often very challenging on the, the softer side of costs, the provision of peak water and sewer infrastructure for seasonal development, public transportation, those kind of things they, they, they have in the past at least a tendency sometimes to draw away from the small-scale incorporated areas. So uh, it just, it's just interesting just to hear some comments how to balance rural amenity-based development with the public costs of development and, and the, the community planning that goes on when you have existing areas uh, that want to be supported to that. It, just, just sort of looking for a general discussion around that, if that's possible. Uh, Michael, I'll start here if you don't mind. Please do. Um, thank you, Jeff, for the question, and congratulations on your new regional growth strategy. Um, yeah, the question rural. It, um, I've, <laughs> we all debated that till to, to no end. You know, there's various, there's various ways to look at that. I, I'm starting to lean towards, um, for example, I just spent a few weeks in Kings County, Nova Scotia, and I don't know how many people are familiar with that area, but I at one time lived on a big ranch in northern Alberta, so rural to me was 10 miles away from a community of 150. So, you know, rural is relative, isn't it? Um, and now I live in Cedar Yellow Point area south of Nanaimo on five acres, and, uh, and, and that is, you know, people would argue that's really advocating that's rural. Kings County, Nova Scotia was community after community, and yet if you ask those people, 
I was saying, this isn't really rural, is it? And they absolutely feel that it's rural. So I'm starting to define it by how people value, how people value their that sense of place, and is it rural to them? You know, is it up to academics and uh, and folks in policy to define what rural is, or is it really up to people to define what rural is for them? And and I think it, again, largely that's going to be be based on their values. The second part of your question is yes, uh, is a real challenge. Um, the challenges in correlating planning and. I, when I talked about planning earlier in the presentation, one of my cautions, too, is that most rural areas don't have planners. And the planners, maybe they have one planner for a community or a region, and they spend most of their time on permitting. Um, but they don't often have the resources or see the need to put resources into this type of planning. So um, so that's where, I mean, that would be a caution that I didn't mention earlier. I'm going to bring back to Kings County one more time, because when it comes to balancing the cost, the public costs that go into this, um, I think I think that that's one of the – Kings County is very much using an, an ABRD strategy, and when I talk about the importance of working with regional partners in rural areas, some of those costs, if regions share their amenities and if regions share their value over those amenities and are sharing some strategies in terms of how to maximize the use of those amenities, they also can share the cost associated to – the priority system amenities that go into making this happen. Kings County has been extremely successful at that in their rural area, you know, putting in public transit between multiple communities, broadband, all of that sort of stuff um, with a variety of regional partners. So that would be one way to offset it um, because there's no way that every community can, can do this on their own. So those would be some of my thoughts, Jeff. Jeff, I'd just like to answer that in a slightly different way. Um, after all, uh, communities the size of, size of Courtney and Comox, we could even say Vancouver, will market themselves based on their amenities. Vancouver is associated with wonderful natural amenities, and so is your region. But I think from the standpoint of economic development, um, Little has changed in your the economy of, say, a small city or a large city by the fact that people are coming there because of natural and cultural amenities. But um, their relocation to rural areas is something new and offers new opportunities. I think an interesting question for those of you who come from small cities or big cities or uh, um, areas around large cities. Um, to what, what, what have you found relevant about our two presentations today that you could take back to uh, your planning department and to your uh, economic development strategies and to your official community plans? I, if, I, if I may, I, I thank you for, I, I, Nicole, I share your definition of rural. It's really what people think is rural. Um, and I think it's been a, a real challenge uh, for us to balance uh, uh, some of the some of the issues, um, I do think it's interesting from from our region. Um, it's coming down to sharing those costs, and uh, it's funny they they didn't teach me in planning school that taxes and zoning matters. Uh, it's it's quite interesting that you there is a tendency to think regionally and regionally benefiting from things that in. But it's starting to develop, at least in sort of, I don't know if we're rural BC or not on central Vancouver Island, but uh, that there's, there's this real focus on the, the, the public costs of things are just at their absolute maximum. Anyways, just not, you know, it doesn't sound very visionary to think about taxes, but um, I, I do think what's really interesting what you're talking about is that um, economic development strategies really need to be focused on the benefits that, you know, they really need to be focused on our strategic advantages, which also seems to make sense, but I'm not sure all of uh, economic development strategies are like that, and, and we, we, um, we certainly provide that feedback from the two presenters that, that your strengths are what you, you really need to lead with. Uh, um, one thing that's interesting in the regional, in our region, uh, recently have adopted a regional sustainability strategy that focuses on rural sustainability, and our local economic development society is 
uh, to incorporate that sustainability strategy in their s strategic plan. So I think that's a, a real uh, a real opportunity and and really important. But anyways, thank you very much. Great, thank you for the question and for the responses. Um, Jeff, if you're uh, if you're finished with your uh, with your question, can you please change your uh, feedback indicator to green? Uh, Danny Carson, it looks like uh, you have a question. Star seven to unmute. Oh, that might mean that. Uh, Hello, Danny here. Oh, great. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask about amenity-based rural development limited. Um, is it limited by existing transportation hurdles like ferries, long travel times from urban areas? I just noted that many of the participants are from Vancouver Island, Sunshine Coast, Kootenays, and Revelstoke. And I'm not certain that well, everybody's in this boat, but are long travel times via road or um, airport uh, scheduled airlines and and ferries, are they, do they limit the abilities of amenity-based rural development? Well, uh, if, if, I, if I may uh, begin with that, I would uh, uh, go back to something that Nicole said earlier, that it, it depends on who you're talking to. Some people exactly want to go to places that are um, further away, which are r really rural. No one would argue that they're, they're rural. Here on the Sunshine Coast, we consider the ferry to be in all matters a blessing and a curse. We have uh, the small town rural feel to this place because uh, you can't get here by road, but uh, it's also a real challenge to uh, development and growth. So, uh, and again, the, 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 the literature on this will show that depending on that constellation of factors, how they set up, uh, you will get different types of people coming to your area. And if you're interested in a many migration as an economic developer, from an economic development or economy building standpoint, then there, there really are things that, that need to be in place which you, you can put in place. I don't think we have time to talk about them here, but I think that perhaps during my presentation some of them um, you know, might have been at least suggested. That's my response to that. Thanks. I, I was just wondering, it's just that um, some of this uh, is preceded by tourism, so tourism is limited to some extent by how far people want to travel. That's why I was asking, but, but thank you. I don't know if mine's muted or not muted here. Can you hear me okay, Danny? Yes, I can. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so I, does transportation limit, I, you know, Michael and I had these conversations um, uh, prior to the presentation as well because, you know, where, where people, that's why I say natural and cultural are drivers and system amenities enable, but they also can disable. So to answer your question, I, I think that there's, there's significant influence from transportation, uh, again, depending on the audience. People don't move because you have transportation access, but they may not move because of it. So, um, or they may move away. We've found in Kings County, for example, um, that folks may move, um, you know, within an hour and a half of the Halifax area. They may move, but they last for two or three years, and then they move back. And the reason that they leave is because of the lack of system amenities. And so, um, so they wanted that rural lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera, but then they moved away because of it. And so transportation, I have seen in the regions, um, and I would say it's not just tourism related. Um, I have actually seen very successful examples of, of some businesses that are isolated and remote, certainly in D.C., that pool their resources together to bring people in over very long hauls. Travelers, ex you know, tourists expect to travel, so they're a little bit you know, less sensitive about um, distance, costs, and time, et cetera, because it's part of the experience. But residents are a little bit more sensitive to that over time. So depending on the audience and the fit of your amenities, um, you know, it definitely has to be something that would require that regional collaboration to provide that over time. Thank you. That's, that's a nice broad response that I think I kind of get along with. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank, thanks very much again for those questions and responses. Uh, are there any other I immediate questions? 
I, I think what, what I might do is, is hand this back to Gabi. I, I'm uh, cognizant of, of, of Michael's question, and I think it's an important one. I think folks might also want to reflect on, on sort of how the information today does impact uh, their work in rural communities. And uh, Gabi, maybe something that you could uh, look at is, is there an option for a blog um, or some kind of interactive um, feedback uh, on, on the webinars that folks can after reflecting on the information, be able to continue the conversation. But uh, thank you very much uh, for, for your questions and the answers, and I'll hand back to Darby at this time. Uh, if I may, this is, this is Michael. The, my, the, the question that I raised wasn't not just for the rural people. It was to ask people in, in smaller cities or adjacent to cities um, whether or not uh, natural and cultural amenities are, uh, can be seen as factors in reaching the goals of those communities as well. Sorry. Carrie Prigmore on the line. Uh, thanks, Leslie, for stepping in and facilitating the questions. We've had a little bit of a technical challenge in Victoria, but uh, we could still be on the line. Um, so I just wanted to close and um, put up the contacts here on the screen uh, for any follow-up that you have. Uh, both uh, Nicole and Michael's contact information is here, and you should be able to see that on your slide, uh, and as well as some resources uh, that are available within the, the presentation. Um, so thanks also for the suggestion about the blog and some, some ways to engage in some interactive feedback. We'll, we'll look into that and, and see what we can come up with. Um, a sincere thank you to all the participants that have joined us today. We hope this has been informative to you. We really encourage you to provide us with some feedback through the survey that will come out in the next couple of days, as well as suggestions for other webinars that you would like to see. Sincere thank you also to Michael and Nicole for your time and for all the energy that you've put into making today possible. We really appreciate it, and the series would not be uh, possible without you. So thank you. Uh, and unless there's any final questions from anybody, we'll sign off and say thank you very much. Hearing none, I think we're good to say goodbye. All right, thank you.